David Cullen Bain, the Dunedin man found guilty of murdering his family, appeared to go into a state of shock on hearing the guilty verdict. He started saying black hands, that they were taking them away. Black hands. Do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. <laughs> I want to assure you, I did not kill my family. The issue for this episode is David Bain's reliability. Does his version of events, as outlined in his various statements, stack up? Or, to put it more bluntly, has David told lies? I'm journalist Martin Van Bainen. This is a podcast series about New Zealand's most notorious murder case. Five members of the Bain family were found dead in their home in Dunedin, on June the 20th, 1994. Only two people could have been responsible. The father, Robin Bain, who was found dead with a rifle next to him, or David Bain, the son who survived. One of the main issues for any criminal investigation is whether people are telling the truth. Lies are told for many reasons. And if David has been careless with the truth, that does not necessarily mean he is the murderer. However, lies certainly undermine any claims of innocence and need careful scrutiny. Lies are difficult to sustain, especially if they are complicated. A good liar has to be extremely careful. Any slip could see the whole house of cards falling down. A good liar has to be consistent. It is entirely understandable that people required to recount events will not be completely accurate. Allowances have to be made for the effects of trauma and time. Everyone would accept that if David was not the shooter, he was a young man who came home to find his family shot. Not only that, he would have been confronted by the horror of realising the father he loved and respected was a killer. Still, it needs to be remembered that David has consistently said his memory of that morning in 1994 remained clear up until the time he found his mother. People react to shock and horror in different ways. After the shootings, David had periods of distress, but he ate well and was able to joke around with friends and cousins. He was able to plan the family's funerals down to minute details, such as what colour the flowers for each deceased should be and what clothes they should each wear. He was happy to go back to the house to pick up various items. Relatives were amazed how well he coped and grew concerned. His aunt Jan Clark, with whom David stayed in the week before his arrest, summed it up in a statement to the police a few days after David's arrest. An actor reads her comments. During the time he was with us, David's behaviour was so unusual and so unexpected that I was becoming increasingly anxious and more and more concerned that he was involved in what happened at every street and just nothing made sense. Even allowing for trauma and shock, it was abnormal. He behaved as if nothing had happened. A victim support person who spent the week with the grieving family said David did not show signs of what she called the grief process. There's been no anger, sorrow, no questions, very little emotion, no physical signs, she said in a statement soon after the shootings. Let's then go through what David has said about the shootings and his family. We may have covered some of these already, but it's worth mentioning them again. An overarching inconsistency with the evidence is David's recounting of his relationship with Lee. According to David in 2009, when he was talking to Justice Binney in an interview over his compensation claim, It was a, one of the pleasurable aspects of our family is that we all supported each other. We had good relations and we liked being in each other's presence. He also says the retreat he and his mother were working on was almost preparing the family for communal living. Again, this is this the um, an aspect of our family dynamics. Yes, they're abnormal in comparison to the rest of um, New Zealand society, Western society, whatever, whatever you want to compare it to in, the, in our culture that we live in now. But you've got to remember where we grew up and the culture that we were used to was in Papua New Guinea. All of us kids. So to us, living together and continuing that close, you know, um, so-called, you know, communal uh, situation and we bring our partners into the, into the household and so on, 
you know, wasn't out of the ordinary at the time. But so much of the evidence shows the family did not want to be with David and that far from wanting to spend time together, the family were going off in different directions. Arawa was going flatting, or certainly talking about it. Laniat was with her father. Margaret and Robin might have been on the verge of finally splitting up. And Margaret was talking about going off to live in town with Stephen. The other major problem with David's evidence is his initial inability to account for 20 to 25 minutes between coming home from his paper run and calling the emergency services. Remember, David probably got home from his paper round between 6.40am and 6.45am, but didn't ring 111 until about 7.10am. Initially, he simply had no explanation at all for that delay in calling 111, apart from it being slow. Within the year, he would recover memories to fill in the 20 minutes, but when he first spoke to police, he made no mention of feeling there was a gap in his memory or feeling confused and unable to remember things. A person who has recently experienced a horrific event and blocked it out could be expected to be a little vague and be aware of feeling strange. Justice Binney, who interviewed David in 2012 for his report on David's compensation application, picked up on this and wanted to know if David realised his mind wasn't what it might be when he first talked to police on the day of the shootings. Just a quick warning, the audio quality is not the best due to the original recording. Even at that stage, after you, your discovery of the mother, which you said is the dividing line. Absolutely. I, mean, I, I spoke, I mean, I did my absolute best to put time and despite the fact that it was you know, within such a short space of time after what I had experienced, they were questioning me at, at length and I was doing my best and even then trying as hard as I could with the urging and the questioning and the lines of questioning um, trying to find answers and I could not, I had no explanation for you know, a period of time that morning. I had no, no answers whatsoever. Mm. Because this, the, the This is not reflected in the statements. The statements are quite definitive. When he says, did you go into any of the other rooms? You don't say, I don't recall, or my memory is confused. Uh, You give a flat no. Uh, I make the distinction that is what's recorded. All of these statements were handwritten. By the detective. By the detectives. Yes. So that's what was recorded and, the, and has already been shown. Some of the um, conversations and things that have been stated to me were not recorded. And there are situations that could have had an impact on my thinking at the time. Mm-hmm. But you do uh, sign the statement at the end. Yes. I have no, look, I've got no problem with accepting that these are the statements that I made and, uh, and I was doing my best, but what they, I mean, uh, considering what I was going through, I wasn't going to read through that many pages of handwritten notes and look for every spelling mistake and look for every, you know, um, situation where, you know, a, Okay, there's a point. There's a poignant question and answer there. Yes, I should. Maybe I should have spelled it out a bit more. Maybe I did. But you have to ask, what was so hard about David telling police he had a bit of a blank, that he remembered coming home and finding his parents, and just didn't know what else happened? If David's version of events is true, his mind somehow stored the memory in a way that was closed off until after his sessions with psychiatrist Professor Paul Mullen about six months after the shootings. As to his loss of memory, some sort of amnesia can indeed affect witnesses or victims of traumatic events, including murderers themselves. The blackout is also, of course, a popular excuse for offenders who have a lot to hide and no explanation for certain events. The way the mind operates to blank out situations 
or fails to record them in conscious, retrievable memory is still a matter of much debate. In the early 90s, many Western countries where counselling and psychotherapy were normal therapeutic practices experienced a wave of people recovering memories of sexual abuse, often by family members. We know Margaret thought her life had been blighted by some traumatic event from her childhood involving her father and was no doubt familiar with the theory behind recovered memories. The hypothesis was that the trauma of the abuse was so shocking and frightening that the victim's mind would, as a defence mechanism, short-circuit and hide the memory away in an inaccessible part of the brain, but not so inaccessible that a key could not be found to unlock the memories and a narrative recovered. It was assumed the memory could be triggered and emerge as a perfectly preserved entity as American memory specialist Elizabeth Loftus called it. Some psychiatrists believe it's also possible to lose conscious awareness of traumatic memories through the defence mechanism known as dissociation, which works to control painful feelings by limiting a person's access to the memory. David's memories are a bit of a puzzle. Here, for instance, are parts of the conversation he had about his memory with Justice Binney, who was interested in whether David could have executed the family in some sort of trance, which he could not later remember. Do you then reject any suggestion that your mind in 1994 was such that you could have committed the murders and not recall anything about it? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's not a moment in time during any period in the lead up to 1994 or that morning. So that when you say, uh, as you told me earlier today, that you are positive that uh, you did not kill any member of your family, you say that on the basis that there is no reason to think that you could have done anything in the so-called trance and not afterwards recalled it. Sorry, uh, no, there's no, I, there is no... Well, what, is, what is being said is that perhaps in good faith you're saying I didn't murder any of them, but in fact you did murder them, but you cannot recall it. And therefore, uh, your, your disavowal could be in good faith, but nev nevertheless be correct. No, I reject it completely. No, I didn't commit any of those crimes. For the simple fact that I know I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. I, within myself, there are all these sessions that I had with every person that I've ever talked to, and confidence, and the experts that have, that have had their go at me, never once felt, let alone come up with a single memory that would implicate me in, this, in, this, in any of this. Well, there is the rather odd incident uh, where you're speaking to your aunt, uh, uh, and as you explained in 1995, it had to do with the three options put to you by the police. It was somebody outside the family, it was your father, or if it was you. And you say, if it was my father, I could never forgive him. And if it was me, that you were uh, unsure in your own mind as to whether there is, was a possibility that you had committed the murders. Yeah, but then, of course, at that time, that had also been put to me to try and explain why there was a missing 20 minutes. Yes. Which I couldn't do at that time. But following all the all the time that I spent in prison and being examined by Professor Mother, I was quite satisfied with my own innocence. That missing 20 minutes was the only thing. David also took the blocking mechanism a step further, as his interview with Justice Binney shows. Justice Binney wanted to know more about how David had recovered the memories after the sessions he had with Professor Paul Mullen about six months after the shootings. But David couldn't recall anything about what was said at the sessions. And in sessions with Dr. Mullen, 
you had a partial memory recovery. And just describe what he did, what you did, and how this partial memory recovered occurred. Uh, in the truck, uh, I have to make a, a, an apology again. The trauma of those sessions was so great, I blocked out a lot of the conversations that we actually had. Um, and I've never heard the tapes of those conversations, um, so I've got no last memory I have of those interrogations I turned them at the time was the last session we had. And uh, you remember the last session, what, uh, what, uh, what surfaced in your mind as a result of this uh, questioning sorry, by Dr. I Muller? I don't actually remember the last session or any of them whatsoever. I just remember going, having to go into these sessions on a Wednesday evening and coming out and one of my friends had permission to come support me afterwards and I'd sit with her and just pull my eyes out. So David appears to be saying that he can not only block out memories of the actual traumatic event, but also memories of talking about the trauma to a specialist. Whatever might have happened with David's memory, he had, conveniently it must be said, by his first trial, recovered enough of the memories to fill in a lot of the blanks. There are three main possibilities here. One, David has recovered accurately and truthfully what actually happened. Two, David has genuinely recovered memories, but they are false and reflect what he hoped, in retrospect, happened. Three, David realised quite quickly he had made a bad mistake by forgetting to account for the missing 20 minutes. He then realised he could claim to have blocked out the memories and by his first trial, he knew exactly what he had to say. It's all very puzzling, but let's now look at some more specific inconsistencies and what David has said about the shootings over the years. The big one, of course, is that David told the 111 operator the family was dead, but only a few hours later was telling police he had seen only his parents. It appears then that when police first spoke to him only hours after the murders, he had already blocked out finding the other bodies. So you have to ask, how come the blocking mechanism worked for his siblings but not for his mother and father? Or could he have forgotten what he told the 111 operator and realised it would be a better look for him if he told police he had raised the alarm immediately after finding his parents, the first bodies he said he came across? David also changed his story about what he heard after he went to bed on the Sunday night before the shootings. Initially, he made no mention of hearing any raised voices coming from the sitting room where his parents and Laniette had been watching television. At his first trial, David recalled this memory as now voiced by an actor. I was woken up. I was still half asleep, but I remember waking and hearing raised voices coming from the living room. Usually I am able to sleep right through because you can't even hear the TV from my room. I was not able to hear anything being said. It was just raised voices. That was all. Then David appears to have told Joe Karam another story for one of his books on the murders. Karam quotes David as telling him, It was pretty heated because Dad never raised his voice. But he did that night. Justice Binney was also curious about why David hadn't mentioned the raised voices when he spoke to the police on the Monday morning. After all, David had said his memory up to finding his mother was absolutely clear. Now these raised voices, you may not have heard what was said. Did you recognise whose voices there were? I was, on, I was woken from sleep when I was soon going back to sleep, but I don't know the specifics of who was arguing and shouting away. But it, it's not something you mentioned to the police? I can only say that at the time, um, this is because of the, you know, what I was experiencing, the trauma I was undergoing. Mm. And there are things, there are incongruities in what I in the initial statements I made and, you know, all through, right through to my you know, trial evidence. I accept all of that. 
Sorry, we have the trauma again. But don't forget the raised voice's memory was made when David was in bed and nothing had happened yet. Also, by the time David got to telling Justice Binney about the raised voices, the story had changed again from what he apparently told Joe Carum. Then comes the green jersey, which was worn by the killer. David first said, on several occasions, that the green jersey belonged to Arawa. But in his evidence in his first trial, David said the jersey belonged to his father. And not only that, his father had worn it over the weekend before the shootings. He also changed his account of when he washed his hands when he came home from his paper run. He was asked specifically about the sequence of events at his first interview, which was only hours after the shooting. And David said he washed his hands after putting on the washing. If he was the shooter, this is exactly what would have happened. He would have gone down to the laundry with his bloody clothes, put them in the washing machine, and then washed his hands to get rid of the blood. But the day after the shootings, David told police he had actually washed his hands before sorting the clothes to get rid of the printer's ink on his hands from the paper run. David also appears to have been inconsistent about the issue of his glasses. In his testimony at his first trial, he denied wearing the glasses over the weekend before the shootings. But his lawyer in the first trial says David told him he definitely wore the glasses during the weekend. So, we have David being inconsistent about who he saw dead when he got home from the paper run. The glasses, the green jersey, the raised voices, the washing of his hands, and his relationship with his family. In addition, it's not hard to spot problems in other parts of David's statements. This is David talking to Justice Binney about the time it would take him to walk from Heath Street to his house at 65 Every Street. Remember, this is a crucial time because for David's alibi to work, he needs to be in the house later than 6.45 a.m. It is a steep hill, uh, and you estimated uh, that it would take you two to three minutes uh, in your statement to the police. Uh, how accurate, in your view, was that estimate? And what was it based on? At the time, I... I, I, it's not accurate because I've since walked it myself and it took quite a bit longer. And considering, you know, I was having to wait for Casey, my dog. Um, you know, she's not as fit as that human she, but not as athletic. You know, she's a, a, more of a barrel on legs than you know, mm-hmm. a sleek running machine. Um, and I had to wait for her, so I was walk, definitely walking, um, and having to encourage her to keep going because she wanted to stop and rest. So, it wasn't accurate. I'm an overweight, not especially fit 58-year-old, and I walked the distance recently in two and a half minutes. Don't forget, David was a young, fit person, used to running in the hills. I also spoke to his aunt Jan Clark about the dog, because she and husband Bob adopted Casey after the shootings. She describes the dog as being very fit when she came to stay, which makes sense because Casey often went with David on his paper run. There is also the issue of the washing machine. David has always maintained he put the washing on when he came home from his paper run about 6.45am. Testing showed the machine cycle took about an hour, but when police started searching the house at about 7.25am on the morning of the shootings, they could not hear the washing machine going. It's possible it had finished its cycle, or that the officers are mistaken. But again, it's an odd detail, like many others, if David is telling the truth. Let's now look at another curious aspect of David's account, his tattoo. In his 2012 interview with Justice Binney, David said he had plenty of recall about the tattoo. What was the origin and timing of the tattoo? Sorry, going back to that. Um, (coughs) After my German Shepherd dog was killed, taken by the council in the field. I was quite quite upset um, about the situation. Um, I, as I said before, I have a, an affinity with animals. I like working with them. Um, recently, well, since I've been out of prison, I've been uh, heavily involved with horses and training them and all sorts of things. At 
So that's just a current indication of it. But my, at the time, being as upset as I was, I just I was out walking in the South Dunedin, um after one of the rehearsals, I believe, and I went past a tattoo parlour, um, and I just yeah, I'll, I'll just go in there and, get, and have a look while I was in the shop. It wasn't planned. It wasn't anything. It was just an, uh, an off-the-cuff inspiration. You know. What's the inspiration? What's the word? Spontaneous. Spontaneous thing. And partly because I was thinking of you know, my dog and just feeling down about the whole situation because there had been nothing that I could have done. But when did David actually get his tattoo? We tracked down the Dunedin woman who did the tattoo for David. Her name is Helen Bennett, and I talked to her some months ago. It was within the week before the murders anyway, and he came into the shop and he was specific about what he wanted. He said he wanted a band, um, a feather pointing down ways, and a rose pointing up ways. And um, he wanted it, you know, just like that. He didn't want anything else, he just wanted it the way he wanted it, you know. And he just gave me instructions on how to do it, and I just did it. Mm -hmm. No, he saw a, one band on the wall, and he said, that looks, that looks all right, I'll take that one, and I'll take the rose from over there, and the feather from over there. Yeah. So he pieced them all together from different ones. Yeah, okay. It must have taken a couple of hours. Oh, we talked about lots of things really. We talked about, um, he talked about his time in New Guinea and um, he talked about, he was a music student I think and yeah, just yeah, things about his, bits and pieces about his family, about how his father would die if he saw this tattoo but, and I said to him, well how, you know, how on earth are you going to hide it from him and he said, he's never going to see it. He seemed to want something symbolic. Yeah, he talked about his dog, his time in New Guinea, um, yeah, bits and pieces. I think the rose was to commemorate the, do the dog. Yeah. He seemed to just sit there quite, you know, willingly and, um, you know, get the tattoo done, yeah. where some people would find it quite painful under the arm or around the back of the arm. He seemed to just sit there and not, not mind too much at all about it. Yes, they came to see me a short time afterwards. Yeah. And they said, um, did you do a tattoo on David Bain? And I said, mm, well, because I didn't know his name. I didn't, well, I didn't remember his name if he had given it to me. And I said, I don't know, did I? And... He, they, they didn't show me a photo or anything like that, so yeah. I didn't really know at the time. But then I saw his pictures afterwards on the news and I talked to my daughter and her friend and we established the fact that it definitely was him. Bennett says David paid by cheque, which had the name Bain on it. Sasha, David's German shepherd bitch, was actually put down by the Dunedin City Council in late December 1992. That's 18 months before the murders. Council records show the dog was put down after a postie was bitten on December the 17th. The records show David handed the dog over voluntarily, even though other options were available. Surely if David had the tattoo done just days before his family was murdered, he would remember that accurately, unless he has a reason for hiding it. The tattoo was the subject of another story David told his girlfriend. She had asked him, when they started going out, if he had any tattoos, and David said no. In the week after the shootings, David confessed to her that he had lied to her about whether he had a tattoo. He then told her he had the tattoo done about a year and a half previously, after Sasha's death. This appears to be yet another lie. Still on the tattoo, in her first statement to the police, Margaret's sister Jan Clark spoke about going into David's room on the morning after the day of the shootings. Here are her comments, read by an actor. I didn't sleep at all that night, and the next morning I was anxious that we'd heard nothing. I spoke to him in bed and said he didn't want to see anyone but us. While I sat on the bed, I noticed he had this unusual tattoo on his left arm. He wouldn't tell me what it meant and said it was for his dog Sasha being put down. He showed some anger at the circumstances of this. He said he got it when Sasha died. David told Justice Binney he had no idea where his aunt got this from. The tattoo inconsistencies may not be highly significant, but you have to wonder if Justice Binney would have declared David a credible witness if he had known David had at the very least been evasive about the tattoo. In fact, David's interview with Justice Binney has several examples of changes in David's general story. In the interview, David said his father was definitely going to have a place in the new house that Margaret was planning 65 Every Street. And that time period, as I understand it, the idea was to demolish uh, the house, put up a new and larger house, 
that you were going to preserve the landscaping that you had been uh, yes. working on, uh, that there would be uh, two large bedrooms with an adjoining uh, bathroom and four smaller bedrooms. And uh, that the your mother's thought was that your father would not be part of that new household. Well, yes, that that has come into being from various statements. I don't know where that information. No, What's your recollection? But my recollection was that my father was going to have a room. Yep. I mean, and unfortunately, I have no idea where this particular piece of evidence is, or but the actual plan that my mother spent so much time sitting in London's room drawing up had each of the rooms labelled with the person who was going to be in. And my father's name was on them. In one of the large bedrooms? I don't know which room. I can't, I can't remember the, the layout. Compare this with what David said at his trial in 1995, where he was asked the question, was it intended that your father would reside at the new house? His answer is read by an actor. No, my mother had basically made her plans on what she discussed with us, and they didn't include my father. She had reached the stage of sorry, that she felt the marriage was completely over, and I don't think she would have settled with, settled with dad living in the same address. David also goes on to change his mind about his parents' relationship, as he describes it in the statement we have just heard. When interviewed for an article for New Idea magazine in 2009, David said his parents were very strong in their beliefs that the marriage shouldn't be split and the family should stay together to keep our family strong. Let's now look at David's various statements about his movements on the morning of the shootings. He's been required to go through them many times, and with Justice Binney it was no different. But he told him a different version to what he had told his first trial, which, remember, was only a year after the murders. Binney wanted to know why David hadn't gone to his mother's room immediately after returning home and seeing her light on. Again, we apologise for the audio quality. Well, I had the thought, I believe, of making her a cup of tea. Um, and because I saw her light on, assuming she was, so assuming she was awake. Um, she normally did wake uh, before I left to go to university anyway, so and it was just one of those things that I would have done. I mean, sorry, my cup of tea, a cup of coffee. She preferred coffee in the morning. Um, <coughs> so, why wouldn't I have gone straight to her room? Just because I was sweaty and dirty and you know, I wanted to clean myself up. I mean, after doing that, you know, I'm still, yes, I'm hot and sweaty from doing a paper run, but you, as soon as you stop any exercise in cold weather, you get chill. So the first thing I have to do is clean myself up and get myself dressed for, you know, in warmer clothes so I can then go to university. It's worth noting David hadn't mentioned the cup of tea or coffee until 2012. But it's the part about being sweaty and dirty that is strange. David said he only changed his red sweatshirt and kept on the T-shirt underneath, which must have been wetter and more likely to give him a chill. Why leave on the sweatier garment if it was a chill he was worried about? Why would he lie about such a small thing? Could it have had something to do with the fact David needed to account for the red sweatshirt he said he wore on the run being in the washing machine? And here is another odd thing, if David is telling the truth. As already mentioned, David and Justice Binney also discussed the plan for the new house. David had seemed to suggest the arrangement would include each of the siblings with their own nuclear family. But that wouldn't account for the house being built to accommodate four children and two parents on a permanent, unending basis. No. Oh, there's incongruities to it all. And I, look, I don't understand what, you know, my mother's state of mind is and what mm. her plans were, what her, you know, overall dream was. According to his other testimony, David must have known very well what his mother was thinking because she was continually telling him, as her diary shows. Other evidence also tends to show 
he was an enthusiastic devotee of the plans, rather than a reluctant convert. In his evidence in his first trial, he gave very detailed descriptions of what the dream was going to be, as this excerpt, read by an actor, shows. Well, we lived in PNG and surroundings at all time that were native bush and in the wild sort of thing. When we came back to New Zealand, we found it was very urban, very concrete, so all the gardening that mum and I had done and some of the others had been to block off that outside world so that we could come into a place that was native, green, had all that, you know, the wild bush, the trees to sit under, a place that you could sit and be at peace and rest from the outside world. So again, we get David distancing himself from his mother in the same way he now talks about being aloof from the family. As we have seen, this doesn't gel with what we know about the family and David's place in it. Justice Binney was also concerned about an inconsistency between David's description of his relationship with his father and other evidence which suggested David resented his father and felt he had no connection with him. Earlier in the interview with Justice Binney, David described his relationship with his father as close, with them spending a lot of time together and working well together. Now, on Wednesday, there was a session at the Clark home in the early hours of the morning. And uh, it is said at that time that you said you hated your father. This is Val Boyd giving evidence this time. Quote, he talked about the family situation so on. He talked about his father. He talked about that he hated his father. He said he was sneaky. He used to listen into conversations uh, that had nothing to do with him. Did you have that conversation with Val Boyd? I do believe so. I do believe so. Uh, and this is uh, somewhat at odds with the picture of a healthy relationship that you described this morning. Mm. Well, look. This is, to me, this is only natural considering what it was I was not trying to uh, accept that happened to my family. If I put myself in a situation where I was, you know, here I was, that there's a father that I respected and, and spent a lot of time with, and you know, as I described earlier on, and then trying to accept that he's just killed my entire family. What's your reaction going to be? Naturally, you, you, emotions change. And emotions change, but the, the idea that he was sneaky, used to listen into conversations and so on, well, yeah, that, that relates back to an earlier yeah, period. It does, and that's, but that's, yes, it's a factual aspect of, of who he was. And it's just one of those things that, okay, you don't talk about all the, all the bad things that happen in, the, in your own particular family. I've not wanted to talk about any of it to, you know, in, in this entire investigation has been forced on me. I never wanted to bring up the whole thing about incest. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, put on me to prove that I was innocent. And I don't want, you know, if the police had done their job right the first time, it wouldn't have happened. None of this would have happened. But the question at the moment is the consistency between these pictures yes. you're presenting of your father at different stages of this narrative and how they okay. can be integrated. Well, I, I'm not perfect in my retelling. It's obvious. And this is one of those situations where they were asking me questions about you know, the relations in my family. I was doing my best tell them uh, you know, the, the, the most amount of information that would be helpful possible. Here's a private conversation that has been taken you know, from a, what I consider to be a private you know, situation and a confidence type of situation and now related it in the evidence against it. So that telling my auntie what my father, father's behaviour was like there's nothing wrong with that, in my view. Again, it's worth noting that Val Boyd was not cross-examined on her evidence that David hated his father in the second trial. 
When she gave evidence in David's first trial in 1995, she said the remark about David hating his father occurred in the same part of the conversation where David had said, If my father has done this, I can never forgive him, and that is a terrible burden to carry around with me for the rest of my life. Let's look again at the fingerprints on the rifle. At David's second trial, the court spent many hours listening to a British fingerprint expert who said David's fingerprints on the rifle were not made with blood, as the Crown had alleged. David was in court. That was his defence. Then, in his interview with Justice Binney, David says the fingerprints must have come from a rabbit hunting trip when he got blood on his fingers and then held the rifle. The other curious thing that arises in the interview is David telling Binney about how the Black Hands incident arose at his aunt's house on the day after the shootings. You will recall the evidence from his aunt, Jan Clark, about David sort of spinning out after reading the Otago Daily Times. David told Justice Binney the reason he had spun out was because of a diagram in the newspaper showing where the bodies were. However, the newspaper of that day does not have a diagram and has only the briefest reference to the bodies. Yet, from this, David apparently realised Stephen and Arawa had got out of bed and must have looked the killer in the eye, as he put it. So if David had blocked out the memory and the paper contained nothing to identify the siblings found out of their beds, how did David know it was Stephen and Arawa? There were lots more questions Justice Binney could have asked David, particularly if he had read more on the case. But there was one question he really should have asked, and that was, did David know anything about Laniet having a baby or being raped? Laniet's story about her baby and the rape was important in the context of the incest allegation. The Baines were a very close family. David would have known very well if Laniet had been raped and had a baby. David could have cleared this up once and for all, but it obviously suited his case to leave the issue unclear to bolster Laniette's credibility and increase suspicion of his father. Now, it could be argued that all the inconsistencies don't matter much in the scheme of things. After all, David has always said his memories are not perfect, and he might easily have picked up bits and pieces from material that has arisen over the many years this case has worked through the system. But there is another scenario. This is that David does indeed have a patchy memory of what happened that morning of the shootings, perhaps because of the trauma associated with the bloodbath. But he must have realised soon afterwards that he was the killer. That was too horrific to contemplate. So he grasped a new narrative and anything else that fitted in with that, except that he forgets what he has already said and, as he is no genius, constantly creates inconsistencies. In other words, David has created a new fiction, that he was just a fun-loving guy getting on in the world, ignorant of what was going on in the family, that his family was pretty much perfect, or should be depicted as such, except that his father was molesting his sister. That his depressed father, not the father he knew by any means, but the sad, bad, mad Robin, was driven to shoot the family by forces outside his control. And encouraged by the faith of his supporters, David now lives that fiction. But on the other hand, maybe he is innocent, and all these things are just misunderstandings. I'm Martin Van Bainen. In the next and final episode, I'll try to bring the threads together to reach what I think is the right conclusion in this case. Thanks for listening. Until next time. This podcast is a joint stuff and tandem studios production, written and presented by Martin Van Bainen, audio engineered and co-produced by Brett Robertson, and produced by Dave Dunlay and Kamala Heyman.